Hello. Uh, we are here to talk about advanced vulnerability management in Cloud Foundry. Sorry, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Molly Crowther. I'm a technical program manager at Pivotal. Um, I also am a member of the Cloud Foundry Foundation security team. I'm Stephen Levine. I'm a software engineer and, and I do product management work also. And I'm a CF uh, Build Packs project lead for Pivotal. Cool. So um, what we're going to talk about a little bit today is uh, Cloud Foundry as a secure platform, um, the kind of inherent nature of Cloud Foundry that makes it secure, uh, some vulnerability management process uh, before and after this thing called Davos that we're going to talk about, um, a sample Davos workflow, and hopefully um, a call to action for all of you for how you can help uh, make this a better tool. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick team kudos to everybody who's worked on the triage and uh, automation security team. So far, we have a, a very big group of people who have uh, kind of moved in and out of the team and have helped us along. Um, that was us at a, a team outing kayaking in uh, New York City. Uh, so just before we get too far, uh, this thing called Davos that we're talking about today, um, it's not just the guy from Game of Thrones. And it's not just a town in Switzerland. Um, it's a vulnerability management tool that we've been uh, building internally that we want to um, start to share with the foundation. Um, so we originally came up with the name Davos, and then we're like, what is this thing actually? Um, so it's also known as the Dependency and Vulnerability Overlord System, uh, Davos for short. It was built by the Pivotal uh, security automation team over the past uh, 10 months or so. We got started uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, in a nutshell, it collects and stores data about vulnerabilities uh, and integrates with Tracker to alert uh, both open source and uh, commercial teams from Pivotal um, about vulnerabilities um, and to collect information back from them about whether or not they're vulnerable to that uh, particular issue and what versions they've fixed that issue in and released. Um, we're talking about this today because we think this is kind of a new thing. Um, we haven't heard a lot about um, security management and vulnerability management specifically integrating with agile workflow um, and that's what we think is cool and we're going to Talk about it. Uh, so why did we um, decide to invest in building Davos? Um, just to give a little bit of background, um, Heartbleed, which was disclosed in 2014, uh, this was actually before I joined Pivotal. Um, it was a vulnerability in OpenSSL that um, affected most commercial traffic on the internet. Um, some of our stem cells were affected, but not all of them were. Um, and it was also kind of the first major public vulnerability that happened um, after Cloud Foundry came about, but before the foundation or even Pivotal really had a process in place for disclosing vulnerabilities. Um, and then the next thing was uh, Dirty Cow, which happened last year. Um, it was so bad that um, Linus Torvalds actually patched it himself. Um, he said that he had tried to fix it 11 years prior, but just wasn't able to do it. Um, it was one of the first CVEs to get a live patch from Canonical. All of our stem cells were affected. Um, and we were able to re uh, release new patch stem cells a day after this went public. Um, so it was kind of proof of concept of uh, cloud Foundry as a uh, platform that's able to patch Linux very quickly. Um, and also, this one was unique in that when it was disclosed publicly, it was done with a website, uh, with logos, they had a wiki set up, they had t-shirts printed, um, and we kind of figured that this sort of thing was going to happen more and more often, that we get very, very public vulnerabilities um, that basically go viral to a wider community more quickly than you could imagine. Um, because previously, you think of, oh, you know, there's a vulnerability in Linux, like who's actually going to care about this? Um, but this was, you know, picked up by the news. Um, I'm assuming people ordered t-shirts. Uh, 
So this was just something that we knew that in the future we were gonna have to worry about. Um, so we're quickly gonna talk about um, Ubuntu security notices, which we also refer to as USNs. Um, they basically are notices that are put out by Canonical um, about the Ubuntu distribution of Linux. Um, and a USN usually contains one or more CVEs. Um, so because the uh, Bosch stem cells and the rootfs um, rely so heavily on Ubuntu, uh, it's easy for us to patch a lot of things quickly um, by what we call um, basically patching for a particular USN. Um, so this is what the process looks like in theory. Uh, somebody in the open source patches their uh, package that gets put into Linux. Um, Canonical updates Ubuntu with a new version of the package. Um, we, as quickly as possible, if it's a, a high severity USN, um, we patch the rootfs and we patch the stem cell. Um, we make some sort of public notification on cloudfoundry.org slash security to let everyone know um, that these new rootfs and stem cells are available and that they should pick them up. Um, and then in a kind of commercial context, the pivotal runtime um, patches with the rootfs and the stem cell. Um, our other services patch as well. Um, and then we make our own um, pivotal focus public notification um, that these versions are available for customers to pick up. Um, one thing to note with this is we kind of go through this process on a relatively regular monthly cadence to pick up all kind of low and medium um, severity USNs that are released by Canonical. Um, but this process has to run um, with relatively little notice uh, and much more click quickly when they release a high severity USN. Um, and, you know, hopefully our customers upgrade. Um, so what's the problem? Like, why couldn't we just run this and, and get really, really good at, at doing this um, in a repeatable way? Uh, one thing is that, as I said, high USNs um, need to be patched faster. Um, and as you can see from this graph that I made, um, this is just showing the uh, number of high USNs all time that have been released on a particular day of the month. Um, they tend to be very variable. We can't ever expect, uh, you know, any particular day a high USN could come out. Um, we've definitely had complaints from product teams like, why can't this happen more regularly? And it's like, this is completely out of our control. Uh, it's somewhat random and just, it happens when it happens. Um, so, you know, we've had several situations where we start patching for a high USN and we're in the middle of the process and another one comes out and everybody has to throw away all the work they did and start over. Uh, the other problem that we've seen is that public notification is really hard. Um, I've obviously personally received a lot of feedback about um, why is this notice up, why is that notice not up, uh, where is it, it's been a long time, what's going on, I see the pivotal notice is up but the open source one isn't, uh, basically like runs the gamut, anything you could think of to complain about public notification, uh, people complain about it. Uh, the other thing is that we don't have enough resources to put out a public notice for every single CVE or USN that comes out. There are a lot of things that don't affect us that we don't notify people about because if we just did that, like that would literally take up an entire team's complete time. Um, so that's also a, a problem that, that isn't completely solved just by having, having somebody responsible for, for putting up public notices. Um, one last thing that throws a wrench in everything. I like to go on vacation sometimes. USNs come out while I'm on vacation. This has happened plenty of times. Um, or, you know, other reasons to be out of the office like volunteering uh, in Chrissy Field, which we've done. I think a high USN actually came out that day while we were uh, picking weeds. Uh, I also have a really cute dog who sometimes like wants me to not work on the weekends. So. Uh, there are human problems in this, uh, in this process also. 
So we kind of went through what it theoretically looks like to patch uh, the stem cell for USNs. Um, to give you an idea of kind of what it really looks like, um, we'll get, uh, this is the, the Ubuntu Security Notices RSS feed. Um, this is uh, basically pre-Davos, what we were doing a few months ago. You get the feed. Um, we did have some automation built by the um, build packs team that would feed that RSS into GitHub issues. Um, we actually have a private Pivotal repo and a private open source repo um, that both would get the notifications from Canonical. Um, I would look at them. Uh, I would look at the Ubuntu website to figure out what the severity of the, of the USN is. Um, there's a little bit of calculation in that uh, because a USN contains many CVEs, you have to look through all of the CVEs and whatever one has the highest severity, we just assign the USN that severity. Um, so I was, I was in charge of doing that. Um, I would go on Slack, I would poke all of the teams uh, that needed to update either, um, you know, hey Dimitri, we have a high USN, can you please start patching? He would usually say, I already knew about it, it's already started. Um, but you gotta do it just in case, and then try to coordinate over you know, dozens of teams who have to patch the commercial distribution. Um, after they hopefully receive the notification, maybe if they're in London, they received it the next day, um, that happens a lot, then they would go to GitHub, take a look at that issue, make sure it really affected them, uh, go into their tracker, make some stories that I didn't have a lot of visibility into, um, and hopefully get done with the patching work and eventually report back in GitHub what versions uh, of the product they actually fixed. Um, while this is going on, I would be waiting for the new stem cell and the root FS to come out. I'd be waiting for uh, teams to finish their stories. And I also would spend a lot of time uh, basically hand rolling every security notice that has to go up on cloudfoundry.org or pivotal.io. Uh, it's a lot of work in Google Docs, uh, contacting marketing teams, putting stuff in WordPress, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that also takes a, a decent amount of time. And then, you know, putting the notices up on cloudfoundry.org for everybody to consume. So, you know, after I had been working on this for about six months or so, um, I started to think that maybe there could be a better way um, that didn't require all of this manual work and all of this um, kind of cross-team, inter-team communication. Um, so kind of we imagined what would this look like if we had some system that was doing all of this for us, uh, you know, potentially even all the way to putting things up out for the public to see. Um, so that's kind of where Davos came from, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, and Steven is going to go through what the workflow looks like for actually patching the rootFS and how they do that. So I'm going to rewind a little bit and talk about this process from the beginning. So while uh, you know, Molly is hard at work with the organizational response to these kinds of vulnerabilities, the engineering teams are hard at work, uh, or hopefully not, because it's automated, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, responding with patched versions of the rootFS and stem cells. So I'm going to talk about the rootFS first, and that's the sort of underlying, you know, user land files and, and things uh, that you can think of it like a base image uh, that Cloud Foundry uses for uh, application containers. So the rootFS patch process, patch process is basically all automated. There's a pipeline that looks at the uh, feed of USNs, and when it finds a new one, it starts uh, you know, building a new rootFS for Cloud Foundry. Uh, it goes through a bunch of steps, you know, validating dependencies and uh, you know, repackaging things. So we have a rootFS for it even works on Docker or that works on Cloud Foundry or all these different places. And it takes about two hours b before, you know, when it, from when a USN hits to when our pipeline is finished with it and a Cloud Foundry operator can deploy it into Cloud Foundry. It's very quick. It's only one manual step where I just say, okay, that looks good, and it goes through. It's awesome. Uh, the, it, it's really important that this is fast uh, because a, a big advantage of Cloud Foundry is that uh, operators can uh, take a new root FS and uh, upgrade it on their, their platform and every single app, is, uh, the operating system level dependencies for all of those apps 
uh, are you know, suddenly up to date and it happens live and in production and very quickly and it's you know, sort of a major advantage of Cloud Foundry over things that use immutable container layers where you have to rebuild each one from scratch to update the operating system level dependencies. So the fact that that's fast is really helpful. <laughs> uh, now, not every one of these USNs is really relevant. Uh, this, this particular vulnerability in the eject uh, which is, you know, is for CD drives that application containers don't really have. You know, maybe it could cause someone some problems, but for the most part, it's not terribly important to patch that in a Cloud Foundry application container in less than you know, 48 hours. Uh, so you know, the, real, uh, the real challenge here is uh, you know, how do we get people to pick up the new rootFS and you know, teams and, and people that depend on it you know, when it comes out, and how do they know that, yes, they really need to update it immediately? At least that's the remaining challenge. <laughs> Uh, and I'll talk about the stem cells a little bit too. I, it's a different team from what I, I deal with, uh, but just quickly, uh, the uh, stem cells, the stem cell patch process is similar. They use uh, you know a pipeline that, that automates parts of it, but uh, the you know, high kernel CVEs are really common, uh, and those don't affect the root FS because there's no kernel to deal with, uh, but they affect. Uh, the stem cells, and they result in a lot of uh, stem cell rebuilds that have to happen very quickly. Uh, you know, stem cells need to work on a whole bunch of different platforms. Uh, you have to build them on VMs, which is slower. Uh, so you have to build a lot of things and on slower systems. Uh, and uh, you know, a bunch of things the Bosch team knows about that I don't deal with too much, uh, but I'm sure it's very exciting. Uh, so how do Cloud Foundry vendors, teams, and operators know when to patch the root FS and stem cells? This is the, the real question for USNs. And more generally, how do they know when to patch anything if, it ha if there's a security vulnerability that affected it and you know, it could affect their users? Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk, so next I'm going to talk about Davos, which is the system uh, you know, M Molly brought up that's responsible for sort of solving that. You could almost say it's a last mile problem. Uh, so. Uh, as a high-level overview, Davos takes sources of data, like USNs and new versions of like, really security critical dependencies, uh, uh, and also you know, notices that we create where we realize, oh, you know, this Cloud Foundry thing is uniquely vulnerable for some reason or you know, whatever. Uh, it collates all that data into this sort of source of truth, this is black box, uh, or white box here, I guess. And uh, it delivers those notices to Cloud Foundry team uh, uh, pivotal tracker uh, backlogs. Uh, then it picks up data for how they responded to those uh, uh, notices from the stories after they deliver them. Uh, it keeps those stored in a source of truth along with the notices and also keeps track of the relationships between products so that it can create more notices of, hey, someone depended on this and uh, it was fixed in another Cloud Foundry product, and now they need to pick up that Cloud Foundry product afterwards. It's sort of smart about making sure that people get just the information they need when it's actionable. Uh, so I'm going to turn over to Molly after that, uh, after this, for uh, some more information about uh, what's coming next. Cool. So um, we've done a lot of work. <laughs> on Davos, um, and it's mostly been in a pivotal context, um, but it also does affect open source teams. So open source teams are already receiving uh, notifications for um, especially what Steven mentioned with new versions of Golang, Nginx, uh, a couple other libraries that people depend on, um, and they're able to communicate out more quickly uh, when their team has fixed something. Um, so what we want to do next is make Davos a little bit more generalizable to the full community so the full ecosystem can really benefit from it. Um, we've been talking about potentially uh, bringing it for incubation um, in the foundation, which we need to, um, we need to do more follow-up on, basically. Um, we also want to make it possible uh, for other foundation members to be able to deploy it. Um, I could imagine a world where um, other members of the foundation deploy Davos. Um, they're able to run a script to basically import all uh, old information about Ubuntu security notices and have access to all of the open source data that's currently in Davos uh, that we'd love to share um, with our partners in the foundation. Um, 
Others' suggestions and feedback are definitely welcome. Um, you can reach me at uh, mcrowther at pivotal.io, uh, actually mcrowther at cloudfoundry.org as well, um, or uh, same handle in the open source Slack. Um, and that's about it. Uh, we'd love to take questions, and thank you all for coming. So it sounds like the question is, what about third-party dependencies? Yeah. Like other third-party dependencies? Yeah. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the other things that we're doing um, that we didn't really get to too much in the talk is that uh, Pivotal is actually scanning a lot of open source, uh, basically open source Bosch releases using Black Duck. Uh, which is a CVE and dependency scanning tool. Uh, and those are actually already also feeding into Davos uh, via their API. So a lot of the open source teams are already receiving um, basically black duck notifications saying like, you have this old version of Ruby, it has this CVE in it, this is the severity, uh, please patch. And then it will take information back about um, whether or not they uh, like we're actually affected by it because Black Duck can have uh, a decent number of false positives uh, because of its kind of fuzzy, fuzzy logic. The other thing that we've enabled is a workflow to allow teams to say that they are not planning on patching uh, something in particular, either because like the version of the Bosch release we're scanning is going end of life or uh, the CVE is in something that isn't really exposed uh, in customer systems and uh, like it's only for testing or um, just something that for some reason they can't patch. Um, so we're, we're both hitting the front of the process where uh, you know Ubuntu and people are releasing new versions and we're also hitting the other end of the process where like what's in the code that we've already uh, shipped. And also to add to that, uh, we also have functionality in Davos that reports on new versions of really security critical dependencies. So if there are things that have vulnerabilities in them often, then we'll often just tell teams when there's a new version at all because they should always keep them up to date. <laughs> so that helps with that type of you know, open source library that, that's security critical kind of those kind of situations. Any other questions? Concerns? Complaints? Okay. okay. Thank you.